Good morning and welcome to FPC Sharpsville Online. We are glad that you've joined us this morning. So I have just one brief announcement before we turn to God in worship. October 4th, which is quickly approaching, will be the date that we have set to reopen the sanctuary for live worship. There is a letter that will be coming out later this week that will outline, excuse me, the details of that. So, you know, hey, pull up a chair, sit by your mailbox and wait for it. Okay, no, not really. I'm just kidding. But keep an eye out for that letter. It will help us set some expectations for gathering again. All right. Let us uh, then turn to God in worship. Asaph, who was one of the psalmists, will declare, We will praise you, God. We will praise you. For your name is near, and the people tell of all your wonderful deeds. Let us turn to God with our praise and let us lift up our voices.
Please join me in our corporate prayer of confession, which will be followed by a time of silent confession. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Amen. So the Apostle Peter reminds us, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. People of God know that in Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven and be free to live. Now, we have a lot of ground to cover this morning, so I want to jump right in. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Amos chapter 6, and we will begin reading with the first verse. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. You notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Calne and look at it. Go from there to Great Hamath, and then go down to Gath in Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is their land larger than yours? You put off the day of disaster and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds adorned with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions. But you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. You're feasting and lounging will end. Notice who God is calling to account as this chapter begins. Those who are complacent, those who feel secure, those who have both influence and affluence. Those who have stopped seeking what God desires and longs for in their lives. Those who feel safe in their homes. Those who have chosen their own desires, their own wishes, and their own wants over those of their neighbors. In fact, they have completely turned away from their neighbor. And what they are doing is loving only themselves. God is saying, I have a question for you. Compare yourself to the nation surrounding you. Did you lack for anything? Was there anything I, the Lord your God, withheld from you when I brought you into the land that I had promised to give to you? No. You have access to everything anyone could ever want, and yet that was not enough for you. You, notable men of the foremost nation, while you have enjoyed safety and security, while you have put off the day of disaster, you bring near a reign of terror. The Hebrew here more literally says, you bring near the seat of violence, which is another way of saying, you continue to pervert justice in the courts that I designed to bring justice. You lounge on lavish couch, couches. You eat the best of meats that money can buy. The choice lamb, the fattened calf. You entertain yourself with music. You drink wine. Not by the glass, but by the bowl. And you use the most expensive lotions that you can buy. And yet what you do not realize is that 
all of that has come at this incredible cost. You are ruining the nation for your own pleasure. And therefore, what I want you to know is that you will be the first to go into exile. You will be the first to know my judgment. God is saying to the nation of Israel, you had everything going for you. You were positioned to succeed. But instead of enjoying what I had given you, you became greedy and you hungered for more. You destroyed the nation I gave you, all for your own pleasures. And the worst part about it is that you actually feel good about yourselves. You have grown complacent. Verse 8. So the sovereign Lord has sworn by himself. Now, we need to pause here because when God begins with the sovereign Lord has sworn by himself, you know things are serious. For God to be the one who takes an oath means that he is promising to deliver on what he is about to say. God's oath would have been unbreakable. His word would have been stronger than oak. Uh, Jerry Maguire reference there. Anyone get it? Um, except in Jerry Maguire, it actually wasn't true. It was a lie. Whereas God can only speak what is true. And what he is saying is, I am going to deliver on what I am about to say. The sovereign Lord has sworn by himself, the Lord God Almighty declares, I abhor the pride of Jacob and detest his fortresses. I will deliver up the city and everything in it. If ten people are left in one house, they too will die. And if the relative who comes to carry the bodies out of the house to burn them asks anyone who might be hiding there, is anyone else with you? Which is really just a poignant way to ask, is anyone still alive? Is anyone else with you? He will say, no. And then he will go on to say, hush. We must not mention the name of the Lord. It will be so dark, so horrible, that no one would dare call on the name of the Lord. That's how hopeless this moment would be for Israel. Think about this. In tragedy, even if we are not someone who regularly prays, in tragedy, the first thing we do is turn to God in prayer. And God is saying that this moment will be so hopeless that you won't even have the courage to turn to me. That's bad. For the Lord has given the command, and he will smash the great house into pieces and the small houses into bits. Do horses run on rocky crags? No. No. Does anyone plow with the sea? Does anyone plow the sea with ox, oxen? Again, no. But you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into bitterness. You who rejoice in the conquest of Lodabar and say, Did we not take Carnaim? I knew I was going to mess that up. Did we not take Carnaim by our own strength? For the Lord God Almighty declares, I will stir up a nation against you, Israel, that will oppress you all the way from Lebo Hamath to the valley of Arabah. God is saying, <laughs> you know what? It wouldn't make sense for horses to run across a boulder field. And nor would it make sense for anyone to plow water with their oxen. 
But in the same way, it doesn't make any sense to me that you have turned justice into poison and what was supposed to be righteousness into bitterness. You will not know hope because you yourselves have robbed all hope from the nation I have placed you in. Again, God is saying, I gave you everything you could want, and it wasn't enough. Instead, you took advantage of those around you for your own comforts and pleasures. Instead of living the way I intended you to live in justice and in righteousness, you used the very system that I intended for good to do evil. Also that you could live like kings. Chapter 6 in the book of Amos asked this question, when is enough actually enough? If having enough comes at the cost of what God desires for us, of doing good, then what in the world are we doing? You know, I think Jesus said it best when he said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Isn't that what the nation of Israel is being accused of here in chapter 6? Now, this isn't new. We've heard this before. Amos has one message for the nation of Israel. You sell the innocent for for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. You trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground, and you deny justice to the oppressed. You take advantage of those who are most vulnerable, all for your own pleasures. You know, it has been roughly 200 years since Jeroboam has become king of Israel, and God is only now finally saying, I have had enough. I have heard the cries of the innocent, and they are against you. You know, it's interesting, I think, how in this life both influence and affluence can lead us to this place of complacency and a false sense of security, especially when we choose to take our eyes off of God. So uh, this morning, once again, what I want to do is I want to turn to a story from the life of Shane Claiborne, just like we did last week. My hope is to give you an image of what I believe God actually does long for. You know, I find that when I hear someone else's story, especially when someone I believe is pursuing God faithfully, what I long to do is to do the same. Now, that's partially because I'm a little bit on the competitive side, but it's also partially because their story encourages me. It lends me the courage to act. So here's how the story goes. Shane begins with, I remember when one of my colleagues said, Shane, I am not a Christian anymore. I was puzzled, for we had gone to theology classes together, studied Scripture, prayed, and worshipped together. But I could see the intensity and sincerity in his eyes as he continued. I gave up Christianity in order to follow Jesus. And somehow I knew what he meant. Shane's going to go on to ask the question, I wondered what it would look like to really follow Jesus. Do you actually understand how dangerous that question could be? That one question will lead Shane on a quest for a Christian, for someone who really did follow Jesus. Because what if Jesus actually meant the things that he said? The person Shane will set his gaze on is Mother Teresa, you know? (laughs) I think what I love about Shane Claiborne is that he really is someone who swings for the fence. 
So Shane and his friend Brooke sent Mother Teresa a letter looking to do an internship with her for the summer. And they waited, and they waited. Shane will continue, I am not the most patient person, so after a few weeks, I got a little fidgety. With summer approaching, I decided to just start calling nuns to see if any of them knew how to get a hold of Mama T. Some told me to write her again. Others wondered if it was a prank call. But finally, I ended up talking to a precious nun in the Bronx. She told me, quite amused, and I think she felt a little sorry for me, that she would let me talk to Mother Superior in the Bronx. Feeling pretty good about talking to anyone with Superior in their name, I got ready. <coughs> Excuse me. Mother Superior picked up the line, and we talked. And she told me I needed to write a letter to Mother Teresa. I told her I had. She told me I needed to wait, and I told her I had. And then she would give me a number for Calcutta. But I was not to give it out. Those darn marketers, you know. So I got the digits for Mother Teresa. I did some homework and found out that I needed to call at 2 a.m. And that the call would cost $4 a minute. So I resolved to talk fast, which is not easy for a Tennessee boy. I was calling from our dorm lounge on a payphone. Payphones were what we used to call people in the 1900s. You put quarters in them. Crazy, huh? So this call took a lot of quarters. With my friend Brooke standing beside me, both of us praying someone would answer. We called at 2 a.m. from the payphone in our college lounge. It began ringing. I was expecting to hear a formal greeting. Missionaries of charity, how can we help you? Nope. I just heard an old raspy voice on the other end mutter, hello. Thinking I had the wrong number in Calcutta with the tab rolling at $4 a minute, I started railing. Hi, I'm calling from the USA trying to reach Mother Teresa or the missionaries of Char charity. I'm wanting to visit. On the other end, I heard the muffled voice say, this is the missionaries of charity, and this is Mother Teresa. <laughs> My initial reaction was, yeah, right, and I'm the Pope. But I held back. I told her we had written and wanted to come work with her. She asked how long we wanted to stay, so I told her we would like to spend the summer about two or three months. That's a long time, she said. And so I shot back, oh, okay, maybe two or three weeks or two or three days. Heck, two or three hours seemed nice. She said, no, come for the summer. Come. Come. Where would we eat and sleep? So I asked her, Mother Teresa, where would we eat and sleep? And she didn't worry a lot about that. She said, God takes care of the lilies and the sparrows. And God will take care of you. Just come. Who am I to argue with that? I thanked her, and we hung up. You know, Shane said after a bunch of shots, we were on our way to work alongside of Mother Teresa and the sisters with the poorest of the poor in Calcutta. In the morning, we spent time at an orphanage taking care of children with physical and mental handicaps, most of whom had been abandoned in train stations. In the afternoon, it was at the home for the destitute and the dying. And then once a week, we would take soap and bubbles and meet about 100 street kids at a local water hole. We would bandage wounds, sew clothes that were torn, and cook a meal for everyone. He said some of those kids just wanted to be touched with love. And some confessed that they cut themselves or scraped their knees just so they could be seen in the makeshift clinic to be held and to be healed. You know, 
Shane talked about how he fell in love with the home for the destitute and the dying. He said, I helped folks eat, massaged muscles, gave baths, and basically tried to spoil people who really deserved it. Each day, folks would die, and each day we would go out onto the street and bring in new people. The goal was not to keep people alive. We had very few supplies for doing that, but to allow people to die with dignity, with someone loving them, singing, laughing, so they were not alone. Sometimes folks with medical training would come by and be overwhelmed with frustration because we had so few medical supplies. And the sisters would hastily explain that our mission was not to prolong life, but to help people die well. As Mother Teresa would say, telling the old story about throwing starfish back into the ocean even though they continue to line the beach in thousands, we are called not to be successful, but to be faithful. That sounds good. But it was at the beginning, but it was the beginning of my years of struggling with the tension between efficiency and faithfulness. I remembered Gandhi's saying that what we are doing may seem insignificant, but it is most important that we do it. And so we did. While the temptation to do great things is always before us, I learned the discipline of doing small things with great deliberation. Mother Teresa used to say, we can do no great things, just small things with great love. It's not how much you do, but how much you love, but how much love you put into doing it. You know, Shane learned from the home of the destitute and the dying that life was actually more powerful than death. He learned to truly say, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Because what he found was that death could be swallowed up by the laughter of the dying and the singing of the destitute. You know, it was in the eyes of those as they died that Shane felt like he was meeting with God. Looking back, Shane said, I had gone to Calcutta on search, on a search for Christianity, hoping to find an old nun who believed that Jesus meant what he said. And I found Christianity, but it didn't belong to just Mother Teresa. In Calcutta, she was not Mother Teresa the saint. She was just mother, running around the streets, hanging out with kids, caring for the sick, going to Mass each morning. Mother. In fact, when we finally did talk, I had very little to say. I just wanted a hug, and I got it. It was sort of like, yep. There she is, another ordinary radical in love with God and her neighbors. After Mother Teresa died, I was in an interview with some reporter who asked me if Mother Teresa's spirit will live on. I said, to be honest, Mother Teresa died a long time ago when she gave her life to Jesus the joy and compassion and love that the world finds so magnetic are only Jesus, and that is eternal. I saw that eternal love all over Calcutta. I did indeed see it, and I did indeed see Christ in Mother Teresa, but I also found Christ in the lepers, the children, the destitute, the workers. I even began to recognize Christ lives in me. Shane uh, leaves us with a great question. You know, through working with lepers, he came to realize that leprosy is a disease of numbness. That the skin is numbed 
because the nerves no longer feel. He said, as I left Calcutta, it occurred to me that I was returning to a land of lepers, a land of people who had forgotten how to feel, to laugh, to cry, a land haunted by numbness. Could we learn to feel again? You know, what I am struck by this morning in the words of God as they were spoken through Amos is just how complacent I have become. You know, I have looked for things that are thrilling, fast things. You guys know this about me. What you don't know is that I may have recently purchased a Ducati Street Fighter in my search to feel. But maybe I need to stop looking for something and instead look more fully into the face of God and allow Him to show me what it means to feel again, what it means to love my neighbor. Because what would it look like if we shook the dust off our lives and really followed Jesus? Let us pray. Lord, I can't help but feeling in our influence and affluence that we have become complacent, that we feel safe and secure in the lives we have. And so, Lord, I would ask that you would shake them up, that in this pandemic, which has completely challenged us, that we would look to you and that we would ask, what does it mean to love our neighbor as an expression of your love for us? What does it mean to really follow Jesus? Father, I pray that you would awaken your church to the calling that you have placed before it, a calling to love you and to love our neighbors. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
please join me as together we pray the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now for our benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion that we receive through the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you this day and every day to come. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Mm-hmm.